came in, but that's okay. It still worked. They were still writing okay. their answers and participating. Um, there's okay. just like a few second delay. Okay, sounds good. Just trying to make sure there we go. She is in the center there. Welcome back. So um, hopefully you all got a chance to uh, run to the bathroom or do whatever you needed to do, because now we've got some really exciting content with Chloe Prayon. Chloe, am I saying your name right? Hold on, I'll ask you in just a yep. second. I'm gonna skip over to our chat here. Okay, I said it correctly? Yes, correct. Excellent. Okay, so Chloe, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? How, how are we getting to speak to you today? So I'm just um, using my computer at home. Um, normally I would have been at school, but I just graduated in May. Um, I've been with Sharks for Kids, which is, I'm gonna be teaching you guys about sharks today. I've been with them about three years or so, and I love sharks, I love diving. Um, and I love just biology in general, so I'm really excited to answer any questions you guys have. That's wonderful. What is your recent degree in? I just got my Master of Science in Biological Sciences. Excellent. And from where? Florida Atlantic University. It's in Boca Raton. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for being here today. No problem. Are you going to share your screen with us? Yep. And I'll be fielding questions for you that want to write them in the comments section. Can you see me all good? I can see your screen. I see a whole bunch of your screen. Okay, perfect. Is it showing up as one now? No. Um, yes, now I see the Sharks for okay. Kids slide. Yep. All right, perfect. All right, so we'll get started. So uh, Sharks for Kids is an education foundation that was started with the focus of teaching kids of all ages whether you're four to 18 just how sharks are very important for the ecosystem a lot of people have some misconceptions about sharks that they're crazy man eaters or whatever that might be so we want to kind of dispel some of those myths and talk to you guys about why they're in such grave danger right now um, because of the current state of the world and just teach you some cool stuff about them so we're gonna investigate sharks. And we're just gonna start off with the kind of most basic question you could have about a shark, and that's what is a shark? So sharks are cartilaginous fish. That means their skeleton is made of cartilage. Um, they are part of class chondrichthys, which encompasses sharks, skates, rays, and chimeras. Then you have class chondrichthys breaks apart into two subclasses, where you have holocephali, which is your chimeras, and then you have elasmoranchi, which is the shark skates in face. So sharks are known as elasmoranchi. So while we talk about cartilaginous fish, and those are our shark skates, rays, and chimeras, we also have our bony fish, where if you go snorkeling, you'll see a lot of these guys swimming around. Um, they are the most abundant type of fish, and um, there's many, many different species of bony fish. And while cartilaginous and bony fish do have some things in common. Uh, the main difference is gonna be what that skeleton is made of. So bony fish, as their name suggests, their skeleton is made of hard bone and cartilaginous fish, their entire skeleton is made of cartilage. And this is advantageous for them because cartilaginous fish don't have a swim bladder like bony fish do. So a swim bladder is just a gas filled sac that's inside the body of the fish and it helps to maintain buoyancy. Um, sharks don't have that. They have a very fatty liver that produces oils, but no swim bladder. So swim bladder allows their, or excuse me, their skeleton to be the cartilage, allows them to be less dense and more flexible in the water column. Another key difference is their skin. So sharks have something called placoid scales, which are also known as dermal denticles. 
And basically, if you get up, we'll talk more about skin a little bit later, but if you were to get up close with the microscope to shark skin, you actually see that it just looks like little tiny teeth all across the surface of their skin. So their skin is essentially little teeth. And then with regular fish, the bony fish, you've got a couple different types of scales depending on what species you have. You have cycloid scales on fish like salmon. You have gainoid scales on fish like gar. And then um, bass will have tenoid scales. And it, the type of scales they have depend on whether they're a more uh, sedentary fish or whether they're more active swimmers like say salmon are. Um, and some species of fish, like flounder, will have different types of scales on different sides of their body. So the side of the body of a flounder that's on the sand is going to have a different scale type than the stuff that's exposed to the water. All right, so we're going to talk about why sharks are so important. And first, we're just going to talk about a balanced ecosystem and how that relates to the food pyramid. So the food pyramid that we have here is just showing you the quantity of organisms we have at each trophic level, so at each level of the pyramid. So at the very bottom here, we have our producers, followed by primary consumers on the second level. Then we've got secondary consumers here, tertiary consumers, and then at the very tippy top of the pyramid, we have the apex predators. So not all sharks are going to be considered apex predators because some sharks are preyed upon like smaller species will be preyed upon by bigger fish or even by larger sharks so they're not always going to be at the apex predator part of the pyramid but they are all, all, wherever they are it is extremely important to the balance of the ecosystem so looking at this pyramid here We'll talk about tiger sharks and let's say just a random specific ecosystem that tiger sharks inhabit say in the bahamas so say these tiger sharks that are at the apex part of the pyramid disappear they're overfished uh, more sharks die every year so let's say they were became locally extinct in the bahamas what that would do is this tertiary consumer part of the pyramid here would become more so there would be more individuals at that level because there's nothing preying upon them because their main predator, the tiger shark, has disappeared. So as there's more of these larger fish predators down here, that means their prey numbers are going to decrease. And so this is just called a trophic cascade where you miss, you destroy one part of the ecosystem, it creates a trophic cascade where then every trophic level, even ones farther from the actual apex of the pyramid, they're all going to be adversely affected. So we're also going to talk about biodiversity. So biodiversity is just talking about the variety of organisms in a specific ecosystem. So coral reefs are among the most biodiverse regions on earth. They're home to many different species of shark, of fish, of crustacean so they're a very biodiverse region lots of different species live in this specific area unfortunately due to overfishing warming seawater and acidifications our coral reefs are in great danger so that not only affects sharks but that affects the fish and the invertebrates that live there as well so sharks have actually been on Earth an estimated about 450 million years. They've survived four of the big five extinctions, and sharks are actually older than uh, dinosaurs. So sharks, while well, humans, you know, we've been, modern humans have existed about 200,000 years. Our primitive ancestors originated maybe around six million years ago and sharks have been around for 450 million years, so much, much longer than we have. Which makes this number here, 100 million, even more unfortunate, because that would be the number of sharks that humans kill every single year. So sharks are primarily fish for their meat and their fins, um, but they can also be harvested for their cartilage, their liver, and their skin. Um, what you're seeing here is sharks jaws and actual baby sharks that were put inside for snow globe to be sold as 
little trinkets at gift shops. Um, but the in thing you're seeing down here is something called shark finning. And what they'll do is they'll catch a shark, cut the fins off, throw the rest of the shark back. They don't need it. And the shark ends up dying. Usually they throw it back alive in the water and it's dying because it, uh, because it can't swim. And they'll sell these fins and make something called shark fin soup. In some countries, it's considered a delicacy. Um, and those shark bowls of shark fin soup can run you a hundred bucks per just small bowl of soup. So they're very expensive and considered. Chloe, do you know, are those, is shark fin soup still legal in the United States? So I, I don't think so in our area because I know the Port of Miami just banned the export of shark fins. Okay. So I know we're trying to cut off our exporting of fins. I don't know if there's anywhere you can get it in the United States. Okay. But I know it's big in um, Asia. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we'll think about where we find sharks. Um, I'm assuming not everyone here is from Florida. So think about where you live and if sharks can be found in regions surrounding you and what kind of species they might be because sharks can be found almost everywhere. Um, they can be found in cooler waters, they can be found in warmer waters um, towards the equator. And the different species of sharks will have different behaviors that can help keep them alive. Can I interrupt with another question that just came in? It's, it's yeah. relating to your last slide, I think more, but okay. do people wear shark skin? Um, not that I'm aware of. Um, shark skin is used more um, as kind of a texture thing, but I don't know. Like, I know that some Inuit colonies will wear beluga skin or seal skin. I don't think it's a similar thing for sharks. I think maybe but they make wallets. Have you seen a shark skin wallet? I have never seen one of those. I'll, I'll do some research on the site. Okay, thank you for letting okay. me interrupt. <laughs> yeah, no, of course, interrupt whenever. So like I was talking about, they can be found in coral reefs, in open ocean, in mangrove areas. They can either even be found up in the Mississippi River. If you're a bull shark, they've been found as far up the Mississippi River as Illinois. And there are over 500 different types of sharks. So take this time to just think about what your favorite species is. And if you have a question about that species towards the end, you can let me know. Okay, so here we have two different species of shark um, and sharks, you know, there's many, many different species and each of them has adaptations and behaviors that help them survive in their specific environment. So here on the right, we have an angel shark and what they'll do, which you can kind of see in this smaller image up here, is they'll hide on a sandy substrate where they camouflage really nicely. And as soon as a fish swims by them, they open their mouth and create suction that sucks the fish or maybe small crustacean into their mouth and they eat it. And then they go right back to waiting there. That's called ambush predation. They're like vacuum These cleaners. Gonna... Sorry? They're like vacuums. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's very cool. Um, and so on the left here, we've got little lemon sharks. They're born actually in lemon shark nurseries, which are usually found in mangrove areas. And baby lemon sharks actually have belly buttons. It's very cute if you look up a picture. And lemon sharks are notoriously curious. And I don't want to use the word friendly because they're not friendly. They're just not timid around humans. They're very likely to approach you and kind of check you out. Um, you also have sharks like the spiny dogfish that will actually hunt in groups. And then you have sharks like the great white that hunts completely solitary and really only is with other sharks if they're mating. Okay, so we're going to talk about some of the body parts that sharks have. So starting with their teeth. Um, so they have multiple rows of teeth at once and you know we have our baby teeth our adult teeth and then we have to take really good care of these ones because we don't get new ones sharks will replace their teeth throughout their entire life and go through thousands of teeth in their entire lifetime um, and they, one could just fall out you know every time they eat and it's no big deal because they have another row it's almost the way i think about it 
it's like a vending machine when you get a water bottle and another one comes up behind it and it just never runs out of teeth so their their teeth kind of remind me of a vending machine that just never runs out of water bottles and so the type of teeth that they have are going to vary based on what they eat so what you have here with the sand tiger shark these really skinny like teeth and they eat a lot of quote slippery fish and so it's these this shape of teeth is perfect for stabbing things so they can't squirm out of your mouth then you have sharks like say the nurse shark their teeth are almost like plates that they use to crush the shells of crustaceans that they eat because nurse sharks like to hang out at the bottom and they eat small crustaceans they actually do the same sort of suction feeding that the angel shark does and they use their plates to just crush the shell of their prey so they don't eat the same thing as a sand tiger they don't eat the same shaped teeth okay so shark uh, sharks have gills even though they live in water they still have to absorb oxygen from the water in order to survive and how that happens is they take in water through their mouth and then push it through their gill, slit, gill slits and out of their body. So sharks will have anywhere from five to seven gill slits depending on the species. And some sharks have to be swimming constantly in order to breathe. So a shark, an example of that type of shark would be a great white shark. They always have to be swimming. And they'll swim with their mouth open and then that just allows for water to be constantly running over their gills for them to absorb the oxygen from it. And that's called ram ventilation. Then you have sharks here, like the nurse sharks at the bottom and the lemon shark on the top. And they do something called buckle pumping, where they can just hang out at the bottom and they have a special, special musculature that allows them to pump water over their gills if they're just sitting in one spot. So if a great white shark were to be sitting at the bottom like this, they would die because they would not be getting uh, the oxygen circulating through their gills and the water circulating through their mouth. So only certain shark species can do what you see the nurse shark and the lemon shark doing this photo. And sharks, they have fins, of course, usually about eight to nine fins. We've got the pectoral fins, that are the ones that are off the right side. The dorsal fin, which is the one that you see as they're swimming, if they're right at the surface, you can see it popping out of the surface of the water. You've got the caudal fin, which is their tail fins. And the caudal fins are really cool, and I'm going to talk about those next on certain species. And then here you've got the bottom, you've got the pelvic fins. This would be a female shark. You can see there's nothing in the middle here. That's a female. And this is the pelt fins on a male shark, and you can tell it's a male because they have this right in the middle, and those are called claspers. So that's the difference between a male and a female shark. Males have claspers. Chloe, while you're on fins, yeah. can I ask a quick question? Um, yeah. Someone asked, I think because you made the point of the shark fin soup, somebody asked, do people eat the body of sharks? And I think they do, right? You can have a shark steak, is that right? Yeah, so there are certain species of shark that people will eat. I mean, if you go to Publix today, you'll probably see, I've seen mako in there before. I've seen black tip shark in there before. Um, it is not an ideal fish to eat just because of the bioaccumulation of mercury. So any, any animal that is really up towards the top of the food chain mm -hmm. is going to have a lot of mercury that they retain in their, in their tissues. Um, because all the littler things that they're eating have smaller amounts of mercury and it accumulates in their system. That's a great point. And just um, back to a question that was asked a few slides ago. Um, so mm -hmm. I have not seen, I was not able to find that anybody actually wears shark skin. There are shark skin oh. wallets. Now there are things called shark, shark skin suits that someone might've been confused by, but they're, they just look shiny, kind of like shark skin. Mm -hmm. They're not actually made out of shark skin. Okay, and that we'll actually talk about something called biomimicry a little later, which kind of plays into looking like shark skin, but not really being shark skin. Excellent. So we'll talk more about that later. We'll okay. Question that. Thank you. All right. So um, this we call it fantastic adaptations because some species of shark have really, really neat adaptations uh, with their fins based on what type of environment they live on. So at the bottom right here, we've got a nurse shark and you can see their caudal fin or their tail fin is very flat. And that's because they spend a vast majority of their life 
hanging out at the bottom like this little nurse shark is. In the middle here, we've got something called an epaulette shark. And these guys are super cool because they can actually use their pelvic fins and their pectoral fins to walk. So they can do it while they're underwater and just kind of crawl around with their pectoral and their pelvic fins. Or in, in the event of a, the tide going out, so it's going from high tide to low tide, they can actually jump around from tide pool to tide pool and crawl out of the water onto land for short periods of time and crawl back into the water. So if they want to go from tide pool to tide pool to make their way back out into the ocean, or they can just wait till the tide comes back in, but they can actually crawl or walk. And then here we have a really cool shark called a thresher shark. And this shark has an extremely long ventral lobe of their tail fin or their caudal fin. So you can see right here, this is all the top portion of their caudal fin. And what that serves as is almost like a whip. So they'll swim up to a big ball of fish, whip their tail around, which sends the fish that they hit. And then it makes it super easy for them to just come and pick off whatever fish have been stunned. Because when fish get stunned, they'll stop swimming and sort of start floating towards the bottom. So it makes it really easy for them to pick the fish off that they, that they stun. And whale, um, killer whales do something similar to that with their tails as well, but just a different mechanism. All right, so we'll talk about fish eye, or excuse me, shark eyes. So they vary in size and shape depending on what habitat and what depth they spend their time in. Um, so sharks have eyelids. They have something called a nictitating membrane. Um, and the nictitating membrane serves as protection for the eye when they're hunting. So not all sharks will have a nictitating membrane, but if they do, so we'll use this hammerhead as an example. So say you're a hammerhead and you're looking for a nice tasty stingray, you find one as you're about to take that, you're in that terminal phase of the attack, you're about to take a bite out of it, you're gonna push the nictitating membrane, well it does it automatically, but it comes over their eyes and protects, protects the eyes in the event that the stingray stings near there and you know they don't they don't grow a new eye back so they need to take very good care of what they have very cool sharks that don't sharks that do not have a nictitating membrane which is one that surprises me is the great white shark because they're very active hunters they'll be fighting with seals and seals have claws so they have something a unique adaptation in their eye that even though they don't have a nictitating membrane they actually have special muscles in their eye that will actually tilt their eye backwards and into the skull so great white sharks are entirely rotating their eye back into their skull instead of just having a little eyelid or membrane that comes over top of it to protect it so even if you don't have the nictitating membrane you still have some sort of protection all right so sharks have two nostrils you can see them here uh, each nostril has two openings one where the water goes in and one where the water goes out. And they do not use their noses for any sort of breathing. They only use it to smell things in the water. Okay, so here's another close up on skin. Right here, we've got the nurse shark skin. And if you were to look at a close up image of the nurse shark skin right here, um, you'll see that it looks quite a bit like the teeth that they have actually. So they have more flatter, uh, more flat teeth for, remember, crushing the crustacean cells and the dermal denticles on their skin very closely remember, uh, resemble what their teeth look like. Okay, so now we're going to talk about baby sharks and how they're born. So there's three main ways that sharks can give birth, one of which is laying an egg kit case. So right here we've got a baby porn shark hatching out of an egg that was laid. The mother lays the eggs and then leaves. There's no parental investment with sharks. Or we've got, so this is called oviparous, laying an egg and having it hatch. Then we've got live babies with no umbilical cord. So they're still nourished uh, through sort of egg sac, uh, like a, a yolk essentially. That would be ovoviviparous. So these are still born alive, but it's, it's closer, it's a closer resemblance to an egg. 
And then we've got our viviparous, so we've got the lemon shark here. Remember how I talked to you about how baby lemon sharks have a belly button? That's what a belly button looks like on a red shark, or excuse me, a lemon shark. And so what that is, is they're, nour they're nourished through a placenta and they have an umbilical cord and then they're born alive. So no matter how any of these three ways that the shark is born, the mom does not take care of the babies at all. We have a question and about, oh, sorry. No, we, go ahead. We've got a question about shark vision. I don't know how much you know shark about vision. this. But do, a shot. What is it? do sharks see the same way we do? Can they see uh, wavelengths of light that we can't see? Do you know? Well, they see better in lower light. Okay. So I know that. Um, actually, I do have a slide that talks a little bit more about vision. Um, they definitely see better at lower light. That's why it's always recommended you don't swim from dusk to dawn. Okay. Because that's when they're most actively hunting. So, and seeing in water bit different the way your retina is it, it has to be shaped much differently than us when we see on land but i don't know too much extra about shark vision other than that no that's great and and we can be patient if you got more coming up too okay I, it's not a much but it definitely talks a little bit more about vision okay great all right so here we've got um two different baby sharks in in their adult form so some sharks look exactly like they do in their adult stage. And you see up at the top here, we've got a baby lemon shark and an adult lemon shark, and they look fairly identical. But here we've got something called a zebra shark. And you can see how it would get its name, the zebra shark, as, as a young one. But as they grow up, they look nothing like their juvenile form. And so that just has to do with the environment the baby is in versus the environment the adult is in. And sharks, we've talked about a lot of their differences, but the main one is size. There's such a large size gap in between different species of shark. So you've got our smaller shark, the velvet belly lantern shark. They can grow at most up to two feet. And we've got our whale sharks that can grow up to 62 feet. And they're the biggest fish in the sea. So a common question or confusion is it's called a whale shark. So some people might get it mixed up with an actual whale because they are quite big like whales, but they are fish. They have gills they have a cartilage skeleton so these are 100 percent sharks they're just really big like whales and then we've got the oceanic white tip this is just a, a pelagic species that you'll find out into the deep depths of the ocean um, where there's really no land around and you they get their name you can see by these nice little white tips they have on their dorsal pectoral and caudal fins and they can grow between 11 and 12 feet Okay, so now we're gonna talk about shark senses. So they do have five sec uh, senses just like us, but um, they have one extra sense. It's their sixth sense. And it's, I think, the coolest sense that they have. And we'll talk about that at the end. So uh, back to whomever had questions about sight, this is most of the information I can provide to you. They have great vision in low light and they can dilate their irises, which is different than regular bony fish because bony fish cannot do that. Um, some sharks, like we talked about, have a nictitating membrane. If you remember that little membrane that comes across as they're hunting, but some sharks like the great white, they can roll their eyes back into their head to protect them while they're feeding. So hearing and sound, um, sound travels fa four times faster underwater than are on land and lower frequencies will be dissipated slower than higher frequencies so they can hear better at higher frequencies excuse me um, some species can locate their prey from over several hundred meters away based on the sound that they make as they're swimming an injured or struggling fish is going to give off a different frequency of swimming than a, a healthier fish so a shark's gonna wanna seek out a fish that might be injured or dying because it's an easier meal than a healthy one. Okay, so sharks can smell. I'm sure we've all heard that sharks can smell a drop of blood from miles away. That's not quite true. They smell amino acids in the blood. So there's certain oils in our blood as well that it creates, if you guys have ever seen chum, it's just fish oil and fish blood and fish guts and they throw it in and they can smell the oils from very far away as well um but they have they use that their nose or their nares 
that look like our nostrils, fairly normal. Water comes in one part of the nostril and exits through another. Remember, there's no bleep breathing involved with their sense of smell or their nose whatsoever. It's only uh, to smell things. And then we've got tastes. So sharks have very sensitive taste buds. And most commonly, the only reason humans are attacked by sharks is because of a case of mistaken identity. And one of the best ways for a shark to tell if you're something that they eat when they're up close to you is to take a bite. So we are not on their menu. We don't taste good to them. They almost never come back for seconds. They do not intentionally attack humans. The, the cases you see of people unfortunately getting bit, it's just a case of mistaken identity. They're kind of checking you out. They want to see what you taste like. They want nothing to do with you after. So it's always important if you're in the water with a shark, it's a very cool experience, but you also have to respect that they are an apex predator. They are wild animals and you always, always need to respect that and respect the potential of an apex predator just doing what they do in the ocean because this is just how they live and we're encroaching into their space. So it's awesome and very uncommon to see people get attacked by, um, to, to be able to swim with them. And it's very uncommon that people are attacked, but it's just always something you need to respect that they have the potential to do. Can you All right, you so another cool sense is part of their sense of touch. They can actually sense vibrations in the water through something called a lateral line that allows them to detect movements and vibrations in the water. So you can see here, it begins at their head and it's a line that runs laterally from their head to their tail. And so that's how it gets its name. And these are just kind of um, similar to the sixth sense that we're gonna talk about with electroception. Similarly, you'll see that both of them involve fluid filled canals throughout the body of the shark that allow it to sense vibrations in the water as it's swimming. And a bony fish also have this uh, adaptation as well, this lateral line, and it allows them to, if you guys have ever seen fish that school together, big schools of fish, they're using their lateral lines to communicate with each other. Okay, we go this way, and they can sense when the group turns this way and this way, and it keeps them really in sync with each other. So if you just watch a video of a big ball of fish schooling together, the lateral line is one of the main mechanisms behind that. Okay. So now this is my favorite sense, the sense of electroreception. This is their sixth sense. And you'll see right here, these little holes here, these are pores that are filled with a conductive jelly. And so if I'm a hammerhead shark and I'm swimming over the sandy sea bottom looking for a stingray, but the stingrays, they hide. They cover themselves with sand so you can't see them with the naked eye. So the shark's swimming and the reason you'll see the hammerhead taking its hammer from side to side while they're swimming like this is because they have electroreceptive pores all on the underside of their hammer. And that hammer, since it's so wide, it allows them to sense at a greater radius than say a tiger shark would. So these guys are swimming along. If they can sense electric impulses in the water, and something that causes electric impulses in the water is a heartbeat. So they can actually sense the heartbeat of the stingray in this case. And the, it alerts them that there is something directly underneath them and they can then attack it without even seeing that it's there. They can still sense it because they can sense its heartbeat. They can't sense anything with these ampullae of Lorenzini, which are these little poles. They can't sense anything from a far distance. So it's not as if they can sense a fish's heartbeat from hundred feet away but if it's directly underneath them or very in a very close proximity i believe 30 some centimeters they are able to sense that the heartbeat is present okay so now we're going to talk about how we learn about sharks so there's lots of different ways that you can do even just as a civilian so we've got tagging diving snorkeling photo and video and research so excuse me um so we'll start with photo and video so a great way to learn about sharks through photo and video is being in the water with them but even just recording them from the surface it teaches you how they move where they eat 
if they interact with each other, how they interact with other types of animals. And I'm sure at one point or another, we've all seen something from Blue Planet or Shark Week that taught us something about sharks. From Even though we're not in the water experiencing it with them, we are still able to watch them in their natural environment. Another way to do it is through scuba or snorkel. So actually be in the water with them. Um, if you're scuba diving, it's always important you have the proper equipment and that you get certified. So when you're scuba diving, you need a mask, fins, a BCD, it's called buoyancy control device. And on the back of that, it's almost like a backpack that you strap your air tank to. And then those regulators that you see coming in through here, that's where you have all the air traveling. So you can breathe, it takes air from the tank that's back here and into your mouth. Okay, so researchers are able to learn about them in many different ways so you can catch them and it's almost like when you go to the doctor and you they weigh you, they measure you, that's what they're doing here. They're just weighing the shark, determining the sex of the shark, so whether it's male or female. Um, you're actually able to take blood samples and little pieces of skin off the shark if you take it off the back of the dorsal fin. Um, there's no nerve endings there so they're unable to feel it and you can gain cool genetic information. So if anyone here has heard of 23andMe where we send our spit and it can profile our genome. So that's what we do with sharks and we can create cool family trees and lineages with all the data that we have about sharks genetics. And another super cool thing that we do is tag sharks. So there are more simple ta tags like that. it's just gonna be an indicator so say we catch the shark we put this tag on and then it gets caught a year from now that person knows that this has been previously caught before they know to either report it or maybe take the measurements of that individual so you can compare them okay two years ago this shark was 11 feet long and now today it's 13 feet long so you can kind of learn about the growth and the development of different types of shark species that way you also here have these really fancy tags that are almost like computers. It can tell you the location of the shark, the water temperature, the depth of the water they're in, how fast they're swimming, and you get really cool information off of a sh uh, tagging a shark like this. And then you also have tags called acoustic tags that can be used to track the movements of sharks over you know, a longer period of time. So basically what'll happen is there's acoustic receivers planted, say, off the coast from Florida to North Carolina throughout the coast. So if a shark were to swim within a certain mile radius of that acoustic receiver, you would get a ping and you would know, okay, this individual has just passed South Carolina heading up towards North Carolina. So you can track their movements that way. All right, and most importantly, what we're trying to teach you guys is that even through the power of information, uh, you are able to do things to help sharks. If it's just educating those around you, teaching those around you some of the things you learned about sharks, doing more research on your own, or getting involved with the dive community or furthering your education in environmental science, biology, any of those things can help, but there are just really small things you can do at home to help the environment in general. Um, even just something so small as recycling, reducing your single-use plastic, picking up trash, whether it's on land or in the water when you see it, it often finds its way out into the ocean. So there, the little things you can do at home make a big difference if everyone joins in and does it as well. All right, and now I'll take some more questions if there's any. That was wonderful, Chloe. Thank you so much. So we fielded a few of the questions, um, but let's see. So someone wanted to know, do they feel the tags? And someone else answered that they don't. I always thought it was a bit like getting your ear pierced where you felt it, but it, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like getting stabbed in the chest. <laughs> uh, so sharks feel differently than us. Um, there are certain nerve endings in humans that are responsible for pain and there's two different types there's alpha and there's c receptors um sharks do not have c receptors which are the receptors that are responsible in mammals for pain so wow. it's hard to answer that because pain is such a 
it's a very human term and or mammalian term i should say so we know they feel it and we know for a fact that sharks can get so stressed out that they die because they produce chemicals when they get stressed mm-hmm. so like hammerheads they very often if they're caught and not released if the line isn't cut they can stress themselves out so much during the fight that they end up dying from that so i don't know if it hurts them like they definitely feel it right but right. we don't know if it hurts them like we would under be able to understand pain I think some organizations, and you would probably know this better than me, like O-Search, um, I think they take samples of the blood to test for some of those stress hormones to make sure that mm-hmm. they're not overstressing the animal. And if they are, they'll release it immediately. Yeah. A lot, of, you see, at least where I'm, I'm from around Jupiter, uh-huh. and you get a lot of shore fishermen that will catch these fish, reel them in, pull them up to land, take a picture with them, yeah. release them, it swims away, and then it washes up dead the next day. Oh, that's terrible. So, yeah. Okay. Um, so someone asked how how long can a shark live? But even I, a plankton biologist, know this depends on what shark species, right? So can you give us maybe the extremes? Yeah. So the extremes, I know the extreme in one direction. So we have the one of what's estimated to be one of the oldest living vertebrates is the Greenland shark. And we don't know exactly how old it is, but we do know that the oldest one we've ever caught, we as in scientists, um, was over 200 years old. Wow, that's So they cool. were very old. Mm-hmm. They can live to be very old. And aging sharks tricky too, because normally when you when you would age something, you could just use their vertebrae because it's kind of like the rings of a tree. Right. But it's a little bit different with sharks because they don't have our the same kind of bone as us. So that's kind of a way they will estimate it. But it's it's aging sharks is tricky right it's imperfect for sure yes and then someone asked about why aren't great whites in aquariums but i know that they have had juvenile white sharks in the monterey bay aquarium but they don't do it often Mm -hmm. it's it's a difficult thing do you know more about that yes so actually monterey bay aquarium was actually the first place to successfully keep a juvenile white shark and it's because i like i was talking about earlier with the ram ventilation they cannot breathe if they do not have enough space to swim. So originally tanks that they would try to house great white sharks had corners. And what they ended up doing, and that's how they had their first success was for holding, it, they didn't successfully hold adult, only juvenile so far, but it was a circular tank. So they could kind of, instead of ramming into walls, it was kind of guiding them in a circle and they could just keep swimming in a continuous circle but they haven't really had a big enough circular tank in order to be able to house great white sharks successfully there for long periods of time. Right. Even though juvenile they kept for a while, they ended up releasing. I think they've had two juveniles. Actually, I'm friends with someone who oversaw that project at Monterey Bay Aquarium, so I know a little bit more about that particular situation than I do sharks in general. I think also it's really hard to transport a large great white shark, whereas a small one's easier. And they also had more um, other species in there. And when the the young ones get curious enough, they start eating some of the other display organisms, which is uh, not a good thing. So let's see, we had someone say, most sharks are egg layers, but great whites are mammals, right? Nope. Can you talk about that? They're not mammals. Um, They, I'm not quite sure if they're viviparous, which would make them have a placenta like us so i can double check on that really quick let's see so yeah so there could be some confusion because sometimes we say that mammals are organisms that give live birth and some sharks do Mm -hmm. release live juveniles or live babies but mammals also have to produce milk and have fur and some other things and you talked earlier yeah you talked earlier about how there's no real parental care right after they're Mm -hmm. born so that would be one of the ways that they're different yeah, so the great white shark, just to confirm, is ovoviviparous, so it's one, it does give live birth, but it involves an egg that hatches inside the mother and then is then born alive. So they don't lay eggs, but they also do not nourish their uh, young through a placenta, through the umbilical cord. So no great white shark belly buttons. Yes, no belly buttons. <laughs> <laughs> shark reproduction is definitely complicated. Let's see. What else do we have coming in here? Um, 
something about, okay, the Georgia Aquarium has a very large tank, so could the white shark be there if they didn't eat the other fish? I don't know what shape that tank is, and again, I think it would need to be a juvenile. I'm just guessing here, but I think the Georgia Aquarium does have um, whale, whale sharks, sharks. Yeah. which someone earlier during your talk asked if whale sharks have teeth and Keith Crowley from the Living Shark Museum answered that one yesterday, but do you want to answer as well? Um, so filter feeding sharks do still have teeth, but they're very small. That's, that's exactly what he said. All right, that's great. And if any of you guys missed that talk yesterday or any of our other shark or manatee or ocean drifter talks, all of these are being recorded and are available um, online after camp. So if you can't sit around for an entire um, session, you don't have to miss out. You can get it later on. I think the questions are slowing down. People may be eating lunch after our long session this morning. Oh, wait, let's see. Um, so there's a, a question about, um, I know that some shark pups will eat the other shark pups if, well, the first one that hatches will eat the other ones. And someone's asking if that's the case in great whites. Do you know? Yes. So great white sharks and tiger sharks are really good examples of this because they are ovoviviparous. So they have separate egg casings for each shark. So when one shark does hatch earlier than the others, they will... I think it's called Ophagy. Yeah. And they will actually eat their brothers and sisters. That's brutal. Yeah. Um, do sharks fight for a mate? So sharks will actually fight with their mate. The males will bite at the back of the dorsal fin and the female. So it's, we've actually found that females have very thick skin behind their dorsal fin because it's called, they, they call it love bites, and the male at, during mating will actually bite the back of the female to basically keep her there for the process. Gotcha. And it's, so it's definitely not a, they're not friendly during the <laughs> So there's a question, and I'm not sure I understand it. It says, what is the average span for a short fin mako? And I don't know if they meant lifespan or sp span of the tail. Um, do you know what the lifespan of a short fin mako is? I don't. Let me see. For, I know they are the fastest fish in the sea, though. Awesome. That was an earlier question, and, and another viewer uh, answered it. <laughs> so I'm glad you could right, confirm. So according to the internet, uh, 25 or 28 to 35 years is about the average lifespan of a short fin mako shark. Wow. I would have said that was long, but then, you know, we learned about the Greenland shark, so. Oh, so it turns out she meant length. So how long is a short fin mako shark? Let's see. Sorry, I don't have all the measurements off the top no, of my head. No, no scientist okay. or researcher has all the answers and anyone who <laughs> pretends they do is not to be believed, so. So uh, the average size is about seven feet for males and nine feet for females so females get bigger than their male counterparts what is the second biggest shark alive maybe we should start with the biggest shark alive and then go to the second the biggest shark is the whale shark and i believe the second biggest shark is the basking shark ah excellent and are basking sharks planktivores as well yep so we have three main uh planktivorous sharks. We've got the whale shark, the megamouth shark, and the basking shark. And oh. those are coincidentally like one of your three biggest sharks. Those are my favorite. Well, things that eat low on the food chain tend to be able to get bigger. As funny mm -hmm. as that is. Well, Chloe, you just knocked my socks off. I learned a lot today and I really appreciate your time. Um, and I really appreciate you informing us on how we can learn more about sharks and get more involved. And I wish you well in your next steps. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Have a wonderful uh, rest of the summer, and I hope you stay well. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye.